Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on what time zone you're joining us from. And welcome to today's webinar, ISO IEC 42001-2023, Artificial Intelligence Management Systems. My name is Stone. I'm a part of the marketing team that supports the Perry Johnson companies, and I'll be here today to support, uh, to facilitate today's webinar and offer technical support to our speakers. Today, we're welcoming PJR Information Security Management Systems Program Manager, John Laffey, and PJR President, Terry Baboyj, PJR's Program and Accreditations Manager, Shannon Craddock, and a special guest, Brenda Bissell, ANAB Senior Manager of Accreditation Management Systems. I'll now pass the discussion over to Terry Paboyage for some, uh, some more welcomes and introductions. Thank you all for joining us. Well, hello everybody. It's, uh, it's good to be in front of uh, this audience and I think we have a pretty diverse audience today. I know we have a lot of the project managers and sales representatives that are with Perry Johnson registrars on the line that are listening. I also know that we have a lot of uh, customers and a lot of our customers that are, are 27,001 and ISO 20,000 certified. In addition to that, we've got uh, obviously some stakeholders involved and then we have some consultants I know that are, that are on the line that are anxious to hear about some of the things that have been happening on the world stage with 42,001. So I'm really happy and Brenda, I wanna thank you so much for joining us. I really do appreciate it. I saw Brenda in Montreal when we were at the IEF conference and the whole, uh, it seemed like everything was a buzz about artificial intelligence and where it's going to go, what the regulations are going to be, what accrediting bodies are going to uh, step up and, and, and take the ball and be able to take the charge. So we're pretty excited about it. and We want to um, go ahead and hopefully have a very interactive uh, session today as we go along. Q&A is going to be at the end. Stone's going to moderate that. And Stone, thank you so much. Thank you to the entire team for putting together the presentation. Okay, without any further ado, I think that... Uh, we're gonna go ahead. Um, everybody, if you do or you do not know who Perry Johnson registrars are, we're, we are the largest ISO 9000 um, quality systems registrar in the United States, have a global footprint um, just about everywhere. And uh, we are in a, a myriad of different standards embedded uh, heavily in, in not just ISO 9000 and, and, and environmental, but in just about every standard you can think of from aerospace to automotive, uh, medical device, um, and, the, and the acronyms and list goes on. But we're, we're, we're very um, interested in what happens with the development of this standard. And so uh, with that said, we're going to go ahead and um, and and talk a little bit about the next slide. So why don't we go ahead and, and go forward. So, okay, Brenda, let's go ahead and open up. Tell us, well, now what is, for those of us that are that are, are maybe novices, um, speak to all levels and t tell us about what 42001 is. Well, thank you, um, Terry, and uh, thank you, uh, PGR for the invite today. Um, ISO IEC 42001, is a certifiable framework for all AI management systems, and it aims to support organizations in the responsible development, delivery, or use of AI uh, systems. Um, the standards designed to guide organizations by helping them to uh, establish, uh, follow, and refine their processes to develop and govern uh, their AI systems uh, responsibly from the beginning and through continuous improvement. Uh, the primary aim of the standard is to help those organizations achieve their objectives, meet applicable regulations, and fulfill stakeholder obligations. Um, the purpose is to steer organizations toward responsible and trustworthy AI developing uh, development, ensuring uh, that there's a harmonious balance between innovation and governance. And as we all know, AI is very fluid. Uh, and is changing almost daily. So uh, this is a great start as far as having a global standard that is overarching for artificial intelligence. Okay, excellent. And I know you're going to talk about some of the details of the standard. And, and um, for those of you that got a chance to read the standard or talk about access to the standard, Brenda, how do people get access to the standard? Well, the, the standard is available uh, for purchase. Uh, they can either purchase purchase it from um, ISO, which is at www.iso.org, or it's also available from ANSI. Uh, so either one of those two websites, uh, they're available. Uh, it was published on December the 18th um, and has been available now for about six weeks. 
Okay, you said it will be available in about six weeks. No, it is. It has. It has been available for about six weeks. It was published on December eighteenth of twenty twenty three. I, I got you. What out of curiosity, what does it cost to buy a standard these days? How much is it? I, do you know? Uh, I don't know right off the top of my head, uh, okay. Terry. I'll be the first you on the spot because I know that a lot of people have, buy, have to buy the standards and, and and auditors, and we can't just go ahead and make copies of them. We know that. So, um, okay. Um, so let's go on to the next slide and let's go from left to right. So, you know, what is, what is an artificial intelligence management system? Brenda. Okay. Um, as you know, there are multiple numbers of uh, ISO management systems. ISO IEC 42001, uh, is focused on artificial intelligence. It provides uh, information about how an organization can uh, implement their artificial management system, artificial intelligence management system. Um, it has uh, controls, very similar to ISO IEC 27001. There are 38 controls in the standard, as well as uh, 10 control objectives. Uh, it includes requirements that you would normally see through, with any uh, ISO standard in clauses four through ten. Uh, so it's a it's an international standard that can provide consistency, if you will, around the world as far as the development, provision, and use of artificial intelligence. Now. I was thinking because uh, in, in this next question, Brenda, it's going to go to you because when I first talked to you, I said, well, you know, who is it going to be applicable to? Okay. And then you talked about both producers and users, right? Okay. So, so tell us more about, about, you know, who is it really for? And then we'll talk about the market case for it. All right. Sure. Um, ISO IEC 42001 can be used by any organization that's involved with AI systems. Um, it's been designed to be adaptable, uh, it's scalable, and it's not restricted by the type of products or services an organization might provide. Um, the standard can be used by small companies as well as large international companies. The standard does require that an organization be identified as either a provider, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a de developer, uh, slash producer or a user. So those are the types of um, uses that you will find for artificial intelligence throughout organizations. Okay, so let's give an example, Brent, of some, some producers. Who do you see that that immediately is knocking on the door? Now, you said that ANAB is at the at the cutting edge of, of getting uh, of, of the one of the leaders, obviously, with with accreditation, right? Tell us a little bit about the world stage. Like you've got some other folks, other large accrediting bodies that compete with you globally. You know, there's the folks out over the pond, UKS, that that's be involved with a lot. There's the RBA, there's the folks in, in Italy, Accredia, all over the so so tell us a little bit about what you see uh, in terms of ANAP and what you guys are going after and what do you see as the market case for it? This is going to be a very large market, Terry. Um, in the past, I would have always said that ISO IEC 27001 is our fastest growing program globally. I expect ISO IEC 42001 to super, surpass that very quickly. Um, all of the major players, as far as accreditation bodies that go in the world, will be launching this program. Um, a &E -B was one of the first to launch the program. We launched the program on January the 16th. We have already received um, four applications uh, from uh, our CBs. We have over 120 accredited CBs globally. Um, we do anticipate that we may see as many as 20 to 25 applications before the end of 2024. Uh, this standard is applicable not only to the ISO IEC 27001 organizations, but also 
to um, every organization. It's going to impact every industry, healthcare, medical device, automotive, aerospace, uh, marketing, uh, let's say call centers. It will impact every industry in the world. So we are seeing this as a very fast growing program. Uh, I do know that the other ABs around the world are looking to launch the program uh, shortly, uh, including uh, UCAS that you mentioned, RVA, uh, Standards Council of Canada. So I, I believe every accreditation body around the world will be launching the program sometime during 2024. So is the big push going to be from the producers of AI, the Microsofts? T tell me more. About, let's let's drill down a little bit more specific. And who you see beating down the door that's going to actually want to get be first? And what and, and what's the case for? What are the reasons? And let's go through that. Certainly. And, and you're right. Many of the large multinational organizations are the ones that have been contacting us, uh, such as the Microsofts, Googles. Facebook, uh, Amazon, those are the large players around the world and they are the ones that are the most interested. And as you can imagine, given their business footprint, they will be using artificial intelligence in, in their business models. So they are the ones, and actually they were some of the participants on the work group that wrote I saw IEC 42001. So many of those organizations have known about the requirements and the standard for the past two years and have probably been working on it behind the scenes. Now, you know that as a registrar, we have to develop the entire scheme from the procedures of how the auditors are gonna go about the audit working documents, from how to quote when it comes to how many mandates are supposed to go into an assignment. I mean, there's a myriad of things that go into this, okay? So um, let's sort of walk through a, a, a producer, a large producer. I mean, and to get your hands around a Microsoft, about how how that might go, how how might an audit work, and what are some of the key features that auditors, our auditors would would you would look at from our auditors to drill into on a company like that? Uh, of course, and with uh, co the large companies like that, you know they're going to be multi sites, so you'll have the one central location, and then you will have the number of sites, and of course those have to be sampled. Um, so we would expect CB auditors to be looking at the controls. As I said, there are 38 controls uh, with 10 control objectives. As with ISO IEC 27001, there's a statement of applicability. So an organization will have to consider all of the controls in uh, Annex A and determine whether or not they are applicable to their organization. And there has to be justification for inclusion as well as exclusion. And of course, there could always be other controls above and beyond the list in Annex A. So we would, uh, of course, be looking at the controls, the control objectives, the statement of applicability. Um, something that's unique to the standard is an impact assessment. And so that will be part of your risk assessment, and it will have to be considered. Uh, during the uh, during the risk assessment. So when you're when we're talking about the uh, impact assessment, we're looking at how the AI that has been developed will affect society, uh, as well as customers, as well as users. Um, there will be a lot of risk with this standard, and, I, and I'm not going to uh, minimize that. Um, there will be uh, concerns as far as uh, how the AI is deployed. There could be some legal actions based on it. So we do you know, want 
organizations to be aware of the risk and the potential for the impact on the solvency of the organization in case there are legal uh, actions. This is a brand new standard. It's hard to say how this is going to play out, Terry. As you know, every time uh, a new standard is launched, uh, there are a lot of unknowns. And we're going to see that, especially with this standard. Um, this standard, it's going to have to be agile. It's going to have to be fluid. AI is changing, if not on a daily basis, at least on a weekly or a monthly basis. Okay, talking about some of the controls, because for those that did not get a chance to read the standard, can you give us some little, maybe a little more tidbits, give us a little bit more meat so we can, um, you know, sort of relate to the examples that we would look at when you look at a producer, first of all. And maybe okay, give uh, us an example too, Brenda, of the Canadian, uh, wasn't there a pilot in Canada that went down? Is there anything that we can take good out of that pilot that we could uh, maybe have the audience in, enjoy here? Oh, actually, the pilot was conducted last summer. It was for a banking institution. Uh, I'm still waiting to see a report from SCC. They're still working on that report. But they did learn a lot as far as um, the auditing of the standard. In fact, they took some of those learning um, pieces and they were able to feed them back to the work group. And those that information that they learned was used to make the changes, if you will, from the DIS version of ISO IAC 42001 to the F DISs. Um, and so if for those of you may, on the call that may not be familiar with how standards development works, it starts with a draft or a DIS version and then it's sent out for comment and comments are received um, those comments are disposed then and the uh, standard is revised and we'll have what we call a final draft and again that is sent out for comments and then there'll be the the final publication so some of the lessons learned they did use um, that uh, in order to make some of the changes between the dis and the f dis Okay. Um, you know, I want to shift to uh, from producers to users. Um, can you, let's talk about the case for a user of AI. So why would I want to say I'm, I'm using AI, uh, you know, and it could be done in a myriad of ways. You can have a front desk situation with receptionists where you can, you can program your phone system uh, uh, to be able to, to be able to feel those particular calls. Um, uh, that's just you know one example as maybe a uh, a, a user. Um, uh, what what would I want to look for if I'm getting certified? Tell me more about the case for a user and why would a user want to get a seal on the wall? Why would they want to say that hey I'm accredited to this? Well, well, first of all, the the standard demonstrates responsible AI use. So yeah. an organization. Uh, that gets certified, it shows their dedication to ethical practices, transparency, and accountability. And the main purpose for ISO IEC 42001 is to show responsible AI use as well as trustworthiness. So by getting certified for this standard, that allows the organization to communicate to their customers as well as their stakeholders that they have met all these requirements and it can demonstrate that they are using AI responsibly and it's trustworthy. Okay, excellent. Um, and some of the benefits, uh, any other additional benefits that you see um, that we can talk about to the group of, of this, Brenda? Uh, sure, as, as I've mentioned before, it, it enhances uh, trust and credibility. Um, it demonstrates the organization's commitment to responsible AI practices, and it enhances that trust level with their customers and the public. Um, it also is going to give them a competitive advantage. Um, organizations that are adhering to the standard uh, gain that competitive advantage in an AI-centric landscape. 
uh, it will show that the organization is committed to meeting the requirements in the standard. Uh, the standard is also pretty flexible and pretty adaptable. Um, the language in the standard is not rigid. Um, it also can be tailored to the organization's uh, specific needs. Um, thus making it more adaptable than you will find with sector-specific regulations. Uh, it also increases uh, customer confidence. Um, conformance with the uh, standard provides you know, confidence for consumers as well as customers, and thus increasing their trust in AI-driven products and services. And it also will give them an access to global markets. Um, ISO IEC 42001 is an international standard and it establishes consistent requirements that enable organizations to access global markets successfully. Okay. Um, Actually, I have yeah, a question, ahead. Terry. Yep. Uh, for Brenda, do you expect the standard to be more popular in certain areas of the world? And are you getting any initial market analysis results that would support that? Well, currently based on um, just uh, some results from our accredited CBs, uh, I have um, a, a list of uh, CBs that have expressed interest in the standard. Most of those certification bodies are either large global certification bodies or certification bodies that focus on information security uh, and the finance industry, which I, I refer to as our boutique CVs. Those are the CVs that are uh, accredited for ISO IEC 27001 and ISO IEC uh, 27701. So that's where we're seeing the interest as far as um, certain areas of the world. Uh, right now, I, I can't really give you any information about that. Uh, as you know, about 50% of our CBs are international, uh, but so we're seeing uh, interest from uh, CBs here in the U.S. as well as um, those large global CBs. Thank you. Uh, John, do you have any questions regarding the um, auditor competency? And let's talk a little bit about, about that maybe and, and um, how other standards play in because, you know, that's important to see if there's going to be integration here, right? Sure. So yeah, no, um, Brenda, I'm definitely interested to, if you have any insight on the types of skills or experience that um, 42,001 auditors might need to display. Certainly, and as you may know, ISO IEC 42006, which is the requirements document for certification bodies, is currently only at the DIST version. So we still need to go through FDIS and the final version. So I do expect a lot of changes. Uh, the comment period for the DIS version ended on January 17th, and I'm expecting the disposition of comments to take a while. Um, I know there were several comments that were um, submitted based on my interaction with um, other ABs as well as regional certification bodies around the world. Uh, there were some uh, requirements for competence that seemed to be uh, a, a little uh, exaggerate, uh, over the top, if you will. Um, so we are seeing that uh, CB auditors are going to have to have experience in uh, information security, as well as artificial intelligence, uh, with at least the past two years being experienced in artificial intelligence. There is a three-day training course that's going to be required. Uh, there are some additional requirements for lead auditors, which is one that I hope will get changed. Um, it requires a, a lead auditor to have participated in three ISO IEC 42001 audits. And as you know, with the new st standard, it's a chicken and egg scenario. So how are we going to um, get these auditors to participate in three um, ISO IEC 42001 audits? 
in order to get them to be a, a lead. So um, that's one thing that we're considering. Uh, Annie B, with launching the program, we are using the requirements in the disk currently. So that's one requirement that we're, we're going to have to decide on an approach uh, because we know that there's no aud auditor out there who has participated in three ISO IEC 42001 audits. I can um, see, uh, Brenda, the, the DISC currently talks about auditors having um, a certain number of years worth of information security work experience and two years in AI work experience. I can imagine a lot of certification bodies are going to try to develop information security or 27001 auditors as AI auditors for 42001. And if those folks have been auditing information security for a number of years, they may fall short on that AI experience. I would expect that a lot of CVs use technical experts. Any it, idea it, about, on, on where those technical experts can be found? Universities, perhaps, or? <laughs> well, well, actually, Shannon, uh, a and is um, dealing with the same situation. Um, as we all know, CB auditors and ANAB assessors or AB assessors have been concentrating or focusing on auditing for a number of years. So they have been away from industry. So I think it's going to be very difficult to find CB auditors as well as AB assessors that have the AI technical knowledge. And yes, um, Technical experts will be one way to manage this. And, and that's one thing that we're considering as far as how to get those three uh, audits for the lead uh, uh, auditors. One way may be to use technical assessors for those first three. And you may have to continue to use technical assessors. I will tell you that um, we have been um, marketing on our website for ISO 42001 uh, assessors for two months, and we have not received any um, applicants. So we've started as of this week with a major uh, marketing program. We are going to be putting out a PR wire uh, news article. We're also going to be um, developing a LinkedIn project. And we are also going to be doing an email campaign that we have for um, different industries. So we are experiencing the same concerns and issues that the CBs are um, going to run into. You're right about um, potentially uh, universities. I've had a conversation with an ANB assessor yesterday that has. Uh, a, a person that he worked with previously in uh, industry that is now a professor and he's teaching AI. So that would be a, a potential there. Um, also going out to some of the to industry uh, and seeing if there are individuals that would like to contract to do a few audits or assessments per year. Um, that's also a, a, another uh, potential there. Uh, also, as far as looking for uh, uh, an SME for your impartiality uh, committee or in, for ABs for our accreditation committees. So again, we're going to be going out to industry to look, to look for those SMEs. Gotcha. Yeah, what I found interesting in, in my read of 42006 is the explicit statement that it's unlikely one natural person will have all the competence to conduct an effective 42001 audit. So certainly this might drive up cost for the, that the client of the certification body. Um, what's the perspective on remote audits or hybrid audits in 42006? I think that's very feasible. Um, I, I anticipate that this will be very similar to ISO IEC 27001. And we have learned that those uh, audits can be conducted effectively remotely or hybrid. Um, you know, in some cases where you 
If there is a, a manufacturing facility involved, it may be that, you know, 50% of the time will be on site and 50% of the time might be off site. But I, I do think this is standard. Again, we'll um, be able to be uh, audited remotely without any issues. Great. Excellent. Uh, John, any other comments uh, for Brenda or questions that you can think of that we would want to ask Brenda at this time? A few things came to mind, Brenda. Um, Obviously, from a 27,001 perspective, there's a, a number of controls that are pretty specific to software development companies or companies who develop software. Is it similar in 42,001 where there's some controls that are, are aimed just at the producers or developers? Exactly. Exactly. There are some controls that are aimed at your uh, producers slash developers. Uh, there are some that are specific for providers and some for users. So you'll find that in some cases, some of those controls will not be applicable and they will just note the justification in their statement of applicability. Okay, yeah, because I was thinking about the point of view of a user, just because a lot of our 27,001 clients, I think, would fall into that. And um, yeah, that's I, that's what I thought the answer was, but just wanted to make sure they weren't going to be yeah. required to implement controls that they couldn't. So. No, it'll be just like uh, ISO IEC 27001. It's uh, justification for inclusion or exclusion. So if they're not applicable, as long as the justification's there and included in the uh, statement of applicability, which of course will be included in the scope of certification with the version, um, then everything is good. Gotcha. And then to kind of follow up on that, from the user's point of view, um, since they obviously don't have access right to backend systems of the AI tools that they might be using is a lot of the risk management just around vetting out those providers of AI. Exactly, they will have to um, vet or audit those providers to to make sure um, that they understand and they have you know some control since it's uh, know probably we could like it it's outsourced you know you have the sure. uh, provider developer who's uh, developing the app for them or you know whatever that might be uh, so yes they will need to vet they may need to to do an audit but they will have to understand um, the risk associated sure depending on what information they're giving them and what the expected outcomes are okay Right. Well, thank you. Uh, that's sure. all I have right now, Terry. Um, Brenda, you know, um, okay, so we know of all the various standards, you know, even if it's ISO 9000 or ISO 14000, uh, for example, um, we know that if, if, as a CB, uh, a lot of the CBs use contract auditors and they use full time, but mainly because of the travel issue go to a, a possible list can be a source going to like an exemplar global or an IRCA in the UK, the International Registry of Certificated Auditors. And you can go ahead and you can look up the auditors by scope. Okay, that's ISO 9000. He's a lead auditor. She's a lead auditor. Um, uh, if you go to aerospace, you can go to the OASIS database of all the auditors that are listed. Now, this may be something you may or may not know, but do you think that um, with time that those particular bodies that, that that display these auditors where they can apply, uh, do you think they will have it with Exemplar Global where you can actually look up 42,001 lead auditors and they'll be on this list? Yes, I do expect Exemplar Global as well as IRCA to add the ISO 42001 auditor program. Um, so I, I do think that they will, it may not be immediate, Terry, it may be a, you know, six months, 12 months down the road, but I do anticipate that. Um, you know, everyone's trying to catch up. I will tell you that um, it's right now, it's hard to find a training class for ISO IEC 42001 auditors and uh, AB assessors. Um, I've talked to two of the largest in the world. Um, one is still, you know, two or three weeks away from being able to provide a class. Another one, they're still in the development phase. So everyone's playing catch up. The standard was published a couple months earlier than we anticipated. 
So now everyone's um, trying to catch up. So I do expect Exemplar Global and IRCA to be adding the programs, but I, it could be six to 12 months down the road. Well, that means it's not too late then for consultants because there's a lot of consultants that are listening in on this because you know with cons with with consultants that are that are out there um they're always looking for to get a new edge right the new standard that's going to be really really hot where they can actually help clients perhaps write their documentation conduct training classes so ergo this is a great time to be able to do that if you're in the consulting right. business try to go ahead and expand your scope your breadth of operation to look at this as maybe a little bit longer term you know uh possible success story right Right. As I said, this I expect this standard to explode. You know, I, I have a, a list of 10 CBs that I know are going to be applying within the next couple of months. And as I said, I expect by the end of the year, we're going to be have 20 to 25 applicants. Um, you know, that's uh, about a, a sixth of uh, the CBs that we have uh, accredited now. I will also tell you that we have been um, approached by another CB where their AB has not launched the program yet. So they're interested. And I've also received calls from three or four AI organizations that are interested in becoming certification bodies. So Interesting. it's, as I said, this, uh, this whole program is going to explode. We're going to be looking at some, um, new players, if you will, just as we did with ISO IEC 27001. Prior to that, we have what I call our legacy CBs, our CBs who are accredited for numerous or multiple management system standards with what I call the boutique CBs, which are the um, organizations that focus on information security in the finance industry. They actually came into play about 10 years ago. And so I'm expecting now another group of players that we're going to see enter um, management systems because of artificial intelligence management systems, ISO IEC 42001. Shannon, you had a question. Yeah, uh, I wanna circle back to training, Brendan. You mentioned a three-day class would be required. Um, so far, PGR has only identified courses coming out of Europe, and that's likely where we'll be sending our candidate auditors. Um, is it just simply a requirement for 24 hours worth of training in AI? Uh, it is for the uh, eight, it'll be three days, 24 hours. It should be on um, the standard, the management system standard. You're right. One of the organizations I've been talking to is out of Europe. I've been talking to another organization. It's an international organization that has a, an office here in the U.S. that I've been talking with. Um, and they're probably a little closer to having a, a training program available. Um, they're going to be having uh, a one day program, which is an oversight program, if you will, for your executives. Uh, in the organization, uh, and then they will have the three-day uh, program also. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, uh, Brenna, do you have any questions of us? Well, uh, basically, what are your expectations going to be as far as certification for your clients? Um, do you anticipate any issues with being able to set up a certification program. I, I think it's challenging now with 42006, which are essentially the guidelines and, and requirements for certification bodies to follow. When those aren't in a final format, um, it, it's difficult to know what's going to stick and what's going to go away. Um, you had mentioned before that there would likely be a transition once they were published. Uh, for certification bodies to transition to the final set of requirements. So I expect that to be a challenge. Um, I expect quoting to be a challenge um, as, as we figure those out and determine an organization's rules and if um, they've got a, a low, medium, or high risk or impact. 
Yeah, that, that is definitely going to be um, a, a challenge with the um, uh, additive factors, if you will, the, the 10 that they've got listed there where you've got uh, small, medium, and uh, large impact. Uh, one thing I noticed, there's uh, there was no consider consideration for no impact. And uh, so, and those number of days are, from my perspective, um, a little above what I would expect. And so that was another uh, recommendation that I that I know that uh, Annie B made is to, to relook at that and to understand the approach or the philosophy that was taken to establish those numbers. Shannon, can you drill down a little more on that and maybe maybe uh, give us an example? Um, I know I don't want you to share a screen or anything like that, but is there a, an MD5 type of a mandate grid that goes by employee count and then by risk? Tell me more. Let's dig a little deeper if you don't mind. Yeah, 42006 in its, its draft form has a, a table and the organization has to identify its role. Um, either as a developer, or provider, producer, or a user, and then the audit days are, are different. So um, an organization can also have multiple roles. They can maybe be all three or two of those, and then the audit days would increase. Um, and similar to what we see for other standards, QMS, EMS, HSMS, or 27001, um, as the employee count increases or the number of employees involved in the scope of the AI management system. Um, as employee count increases, the, the audit duration increases, which may or may not be the best system. And then as Brenda mentioned, there's additional factors that could influence um, the complexity of the artificial intelligence management system, which might lead to increasing that audit time. Okay. Uh, can I ask Brenda, I, I just want to circle back on something, if you don't mind. Did you say that there were some AI companies looking to get into the certification body space? Correct. We have okay. uh, been uh, uh, contacted by at least three or four that have AI in their um, organizational name. None of them have applied yet, so I really don't know what they do. Um, sure. But we have had uh, some inquiries from uh, got, AI organizations. They got me to thinking, and I don't know, I don't have 42006, I know Shannon does. But invariably, when certification bodies start to use AI to handle parts of the audit or certification process, are there requirements around that? Because I don't know how you could bet out the competency of AI, which I think kind of goes to the heart of the whole <laughs> one of the issues, right, with, with AI in general, is it's a black box. Yeah, and it's funny you should ask. IAF, which is the um, you know International Accreditation Forum, that is the oversight for ABs, has established an AI work group, and we are looking at the use of AI. And accreditation as well as certification and then IAAR which PGR is a member of it's a, a US um, CB regional organization has uh, also established an AI group had, they had their first meeting earlier this week I'm a member of both groups um, so you're right certification bodies are already looking at how to use um, artificial intelligence um, in the certification process. Accreditation bodies uh, are looking at it also. There's one already in Asia that's using AI to write reports. Um, I can see AI also being used to write nonconformities, which should help to make them a little more consistent. Um, they could all, uh, AI could also be used to uh, develop um, the audit plan. So yes, AI will be coming to the certification and the accreditation uh, industry. I don't think it'll happen this year, but um, possibly, definitely within the next two or three years. And yes, these work groups are gonna be working on um, trying to identify some requirements, if you will, 
So there mm -hmm. is uh, consistency among the um, certification bodies and accreditation bodies. Now, whether IF will develop a mandatory document or an informative document, we haven't got that far. Um, we've had two meetings and basically just to identify our terms of reference. Gotcha. Right. Thank you. Well, certainly we've discussed AI here and are, are well on the path to be able to assist us in, uh, in the process and the low hanging fruit are the areas that you just talked about, the audit plans. And also um, everybody knows once the auditor is completed with the audit, uh, they has to go through a second set of eyes, which is an executive committee review process. Mm -hmm. Portions of that, uh, even depending on the standard, if not most of that can be done with AI. And so that's pretty exciting because it represents a large part of the labor that the registrar has to have to be able to complete that process to issue that certificate. So, so we're equally excited, just as every industry is excited about it too, to make our jobs easier. So, okay, with that said, Stone, are you there? Let's go ahead and maybe get some questions. Let's reach out to our, to our audience and see if we can't um, see what kind of questions are gonna come up here. Okay, so uh, we have a couple questions. Uh, the first one, is uh, in relation to uh, sec sector specific experience. It says AI is used in healthcare, drug manufacturing, finance, uh, particularly the banking sectors and aerospace sectors. Do the AI auditors need to have respective experience in these sector industries in order to meet auditor qualifications? Uh Brenda Shannon, or who, who wants to take that one? Talk a little bit more. We talked a little bit about the experience, but uh, maybe just elaborate a little more. Well, I think, Shannon, if I'm not mistaken, right, we're, we're required for all of our programs to establish sector-specific competency criteria and ensure that the auditors we select meet that, as well as it could be regional, it could be, you know, laws and regulations. Absolutely. Um, to a certain geographic area. So I think that's consistent for all the standards, I would imagine. Yeah, all the standards have some, some set of requirements related to competency, determining the competency requirements and making sure those requirements are fulfilled. 42,006 speaks to that, as well as some, some qualifications that, that auditors need to have. Um, and I think it's important for organizations to remember that their internal audit team um, it needs to be competent as well. So they're going to need to understand what their internal auditors need. Good point. To in, um, which very likely could in include sector specific requirements or local legislation uh, regarding the use of AI. I know in some states, um, in the United States, it's a requirement that if an organization is using AI, it's it's made very clear, public and transparent to the end user. You know, it's funny, I I um when we when this all sort of came up from Montreal, um, we went ahead and ran ads for uh, for AI ex experts, and I've interviewed multiple people now. And I envision the same thing that we just talked about because John, you and your expert 27,001 team, information security team, you understand the standards. You, you grew up in the ISO world, ISO 9000, you do integrated audits, right? Um, so you understand the disciplines required of quality management system standards, how everything goes into place. However, these people are clueless when it comes down to understanding our neck of the woods. So we're gonna have to use these technical experts as just a model to be able to go in to working with these clients and uh, we're just going to have to accept that because these people are it's going to be very difficult for them to go you know and largely because of they're very high priced people okay these people are making a lot of money and i don't see them going and taking a, a you know a, a lead auditor clor, a course for so many days uh, and then going through 20 audit days to be able to discipline themselves, you know, at, at a lower level, just to be able to get into this. Now, not to say that it can't be done. There may be some of that, but that's not going to be the case most of the time. So we'll we'll, we'll be using the, that approach with technical experts for sure. Yeah, I, I see it being a group effort, definitely. Okay, uh, Stone, what else do we have? Awesome. So uh, another question goes, 
understanding that there are two scopes of certification. If someone is a certified user, do they need to be a certified developer? Interesting. Yeah. I'll leave yeah. that to the, the, Yeah, the, the standard allows um, for an organization to be one of or multiple um, of the roles. So they could be a developer, they can be a provider, or they can be a user, or they can be two of the three or all three. As Shannon alluded to, the audit days table in ISO IEC 42006 is the same, the starting point is the same as ISO IEC 27001. But then depending upon whether they're uh, a provider, a developer, or a user, there are, and this is different from all the other standards, there is a different column for the number of audit days. And then if they are multi have multiple roles, there's another column for that. So there are actually four columns across the audit days table. Brenda, was that correct that there are no discounts on that audit time? I, I know that, for, for example, MD5 allows up to a 30% reduction in audit time, if of course it can be justified. I'm, I'm seeing that that's not an option in at least the draft version of 2006. You're, you're absolutely right. There is no option for any reductions, only additions. Um, I, again, I'm, I'm hoping that that may be changed or at least some consideration given. Um, of course, you'll still have the reallocation for, we used to call it offsite activities, but with the remote audits, so let's say administrative, the report writing, the planning, so on and so forth. But that also um, is, is not uh, clearly stated. So I'm hoping some of that will be clarified with the FDIS. Um, I think we'll see the FDIS probably go out for comment, I'm gonna say in a couple months. So probably near the end of March. Uh, and of course it'll go out for, I think it's eight weeks this time, it'll go out for comment. And then it'll have to come back uh, for uh, resolution of the comments. I do not, I expect a lot of changes between the DIS and the FDIS. I do not anticipate a lot of change between the FDIS and the final publication, as is with most standards. Don't, anything else? So we, uh, there's a couple that just came in. Um, would a developer require a multi-site or limit to the or origin site? Repeat that again, one more time. Kind of worded a little funny. It says, would a developer require a multi-site or limit to the origin sites? Well, uh, uh, th this will be the same as with ISO IEC 27001. The scope of certification can be limited. So if they wanted it to limit it to one location, they could. Uh, now, Per ISO IEC 42006 right now, they have not provided any information about how to manage a multi-site. As you may know, this is going to be changing with ISO IEC 27006-1, the way it's calculated. Uh, going forward with um, the new version of ISO IEC 27006-1, it's going to be a dash one. Um, for multi-sites, you'll be able to include all employees across all sites and then determine how you want to allocate those number of days. That will be the preferred way of calculating the number of audit days for a multi-site. If you decide to continue with the current approach, which is to calculate the number of audit days by site, you have to provide justification. Um, but I have not seen that in ISO IEC 42006, which surprised me a little bit. Interesting. Awesome. So uh, one last question. It says, uh, what can the, and this is a bit broad, you guys probably touched on this a lot already. 
But what can the compliance industry focus on in terms of the new ISO IAC 42001 standards to best protect and inform our clients on AI practices? Can you stab at that, Enda? Yeah, the well, the yeah, yeah, the standard's going to require that there be communication between the organization and their customers and stakeholders. So the organization is going to have to communicate that information. Uh, that, that'll be one of the requirements within the um, standard. Yeah, and I think additionally, and, uh, the standard directs, I'm sorry, Brenda, uh, the standard directs that they have to be you know, aware of and complying with all regulatory uh, requirements related to AI. Um, so I think that would help drive compliance as well. Awesome. So I think that is uh, all of the questions that we have currently. Um, oh, wait, there is one that came in. You know, you know what? I've got a comment now because I'm I'm not clear on the scoping. I'm just not, and because I haven't I haven't dug as deep as everybody else has. So, say I'm a, an organization that's got a single site and I've got 500 employees, and I want to develop AI for just a single area, and that's to be able to answer the phones and be able to be able to deal with a, a front desk dispatch situation of of of, of from a from an incoming intake of calls. And say I only have maybe, I don't know, seven people that are out of that 500 or maybe six people that are responsible for that particular activity. How would I quote that and how would we scope that, Brenda? Well, it'd be very similar to ISO IAC 27001, and I'm sure John's quite aware of this. You can limit the scope to a particular platform, application, or even the IT department. So in this case, if you were looking at only one application, you could limit the scope of certification to that one application. Okay. The, it appears the standard is going to allow for that. Okay. And then just the folks who had access to that application, right, Brenda, or that, that asset? Correct. So that will be important for us to analyze that when it comes down to trying to save the client as much time and money in terms of you know, pinpointing the audit days for sure. So I understand. Okay. Uh, Stone, any wrap ups that we have? No other questions? There was a couple of people who submitted like statements, but uh, I don't think uh, there's any more questions. Um, Is there any statements that would be beneficial to the group, you think, at this point? If, uh, if so, read them. If not, we can conclude today's. Um, uh, webinar. So one person mentioned that um, ISO standards are not like uh, globally required, but that some industries and countries have more stringent regulations, and those are the ones that will probably have more um, adoption of these ISO standards, especially the 42001. Um, and then he, uh, the question, the the statement pretty much just delves into how um, as competitiveness increases, um, ISO adoption probably also increases in order to set companies apart and that sort of thing. So even though certain countries may not require those ISO standards, um, you might see adoption as like technology advances, competition increases, and whatnot. But that was just a kind of general statement and wasn't really a question. But uh, yeah, uh, so we'll move on from the questions and here's some contact information uh, that you can reach out to PJR with. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll also be uploading the slides onto our website. Uh, we'll be uploading this presentation onto YouTube as well. Um, does anybody have any closing remarks in relation to ISO 42001? No. I don't think so. Well, listen, thanks to the panel. Uh, John Laffey, I'd like to thank you for your time. Shannon Craddock, 
Excellent. And and uh, Brenda, thank you as our as our guest speaker. We really do appreciate all your input. You're at the cutting edge of everything. And we look forward, perhaps, uh, as things develop and having another webinar, we can share more information uh, with folks as, as a little progress update. So, so with that said, we're going to go ahead and sign off. We're in Troy, Michigan here and uh, at our Perry Johnson headquarters. And we'll let everybody go. And everybody have a great day. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Terry. Bye-bye. Thanks, Brenda.